I want to introduce somebody special to y'all this morning. Mr. and Mrs. Hinton Boxen, right over here. They got married this week. Stand. Stand just a second there. They slipped. They, they like two teenagers. They slipped off and got married. Glad y'all are here this morning. Praise the Lord for you. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. This morning, if you would please, turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Sometimes we get to thinking that they, there is nobody that stands up for the truth. There's nobody left that uh, stands for the Word of God and worships the Lord and serves the Lord because it seems like it's just a win in the way. But it's something that I have learned from studying the Scriptures. God is never caught without notice of what's going on. There's a principle throughout the Word of God. When it seems Satan has taken over, there's always a remnant according to election of grace that when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord sh shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59, verse 19. God always has somebody that will stand for the truth. And that's what the story of Noah is about. And so if you'll turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 6. I want to begin reading verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the Son of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he had made men on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall I make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which shall, thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall thou make to the ark, and in the cubit shall thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shall thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh, wherein is a breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die, but with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. 
and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you'll open our spiritual eyes, everyone, that we can see the grace of God in this life of this man Noah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First of all, in Genesis chapter 6, the desirable destruction of the world is announced. Now, I want to give you some things about Noah, though, in chapter 6 of Genesis. Noah was saved by grace. Look at chapter 6 and verse 8 with me, please. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, if you go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it talks about every human being, how they get saved. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not yourselves a gift of God, not a works, lest any man should boast. Noah, the second thing about Noah, Noah was a righteous man. Look at verse 9 with me a minute. In verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. So Noah was a righteous man. And salvation by grace should always be followed by a life of good works. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 said we're to do good works after we're saved. Uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 11 through 15 speaks of the same thing. After we're saved we're to walk in newness of life. We're to walk in good works. Thirdly, Noah's bloodline was not contaminated by the fallen line of Seth or the ungodly. Verse 9 again. This generation of Noah, the Bible says the word just here, the word just used here means right with God. In other words, when all other men were living in sin and doing that which was against God, the Bible says that Noah was walking and doing that which were right with God. Fourthly, Noah walked in godly communion with God. Verse 9 again says, Noah walked with God. Noah was obedient to the word of God. Verse 22 says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. The Bible says, Can two walk together if they don't agree? The answer is, No, they can't do it. So Noah agreed with every word of God. Now, I want you to watch this. Uh, fifthly, all of Noah's actions were the results of faith in God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says that faith pleases God. Now, when a sinner gets saved by grace and lives a life of reality with God, God will be with him and use him. Sixth thing is taught here. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Turn with me to 2 Peter for just a few minutes. And I want you to watch some things that's taught here in the book of Peter. And we'll be going back and forth to Peter in just a few minutes. But 2 Peter, please, chapter 2 and verse... I'm going the wrong way. Give me just a second here. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, please. Verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, I want you to watch this. 
God says here that he spared not the world, the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world. Notice God always provides the world with a witness to himself and to warn the world of coming judgment. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, says Enoch, like Noah, walked with God. So God always has a witness of coming judgment. Turn with me now to Jude, the little book just before the Revelation. I'll get to something in just a minute. Stay with me. In Jude, I want you to look at verses 14 and verse 15. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now watch this. Which all proves God in his holy matchless grace always provides a way of salvation for those that he wins to himself. Now notice how God saved Noah by the ark. The ark is a type and figure of salvation. Go back now to Genesis with me for this just a minute and I want you to look at chapter 7 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Notice how God uses the word come with salvation. Did you know that Jesus said the same thing? In Genesis chapter one, chapter 7 verse 1, 8, God says come into the ark. Matthew chapter 11 verse 8, 28, Jesus said come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Isaiah 1 verse 8, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. You know what God's always said? Come unto me. Come to me, I'll save your soul, amen? All through the Bible, you'll find this word, come unto me. Now notice, get the typology picture here of salvation that's given to us in Genesis. Now turn back with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 3. In 1 Peter, chapter 3, please. And I want you to look with me in verse 20 and verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, and verse 21. Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. But watch the next verse. The like figure, wherein they even baptism doeth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now notice here, Noah and the eight souls that were in the ark were saved by water here, it says. But it says the like figure. Now, somebody says you got to get saved to wash, uh, you got to get baptized to wash away your sins. Nowhere in the Bible is that taught. It's taught that the blood of Jesus Christ washes our sins away. It is saying here that water saved by water is a like figure. So when you get baptized, you're showing a like figure of what Jesus has done for you. You cannot make a picture without the person being born first. You cannot have salvation without being born first. And then you show the picture. And being baptism, uh, going through the water baptism, is nothing in the world uh, but the picture of salvation. I'll give you something else about the uh, Noah getting into the ark as a type of salvation. You can't find anywhere in the Bible that God told Noah to put eight pegs on the wall and uh, every one of y'all hang on to those pegs and you shall be saved. No, he didn't. And now we got the, we got the, all kind of denominations today. Just hang on now. Just hang on. You'll be saved. No, sir. God hanged on to me. Amen. You know, any, the only thing God's ever asked anybody to do to be saved, come into the ark. Come into Christ Jesus. That's safety. 
That's where you took care of. They were saved by entering the door. God told Noah in building the ark, the door, not doors of the ark, shall they sit in the side thereof. Now I want to give you something. You know there's not a half a dozen ways to get saved. There's only one. And that's through the door. The Lord Jesus Christ. In John 10 verse 9, Jesus is the door of salvation. And he's the only way you can get in. Now note some Noah and the eighth person in a place of safety because the Lord shut them in. Did you know since the day I got saved, the devil can't touch me unless the Lord allows it? He can't have me. The only way the devil can ever get to you is God says, try my saint and see if he won't stay for me. Amen. And God will put you through a time of testing. But thank God he'll never turn loose of you. And then the Bible says in Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, the Lord shut the door. There, notice the next thing, their salvation was threefold. In Genesis 6, verse 16, go back with me, please. In Genesis 6 and verse 16, a window shall thou make to the ark, and in the cubit shall thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall thou sit in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shall thou make it. Our salvation is threefold. Every believer is saved in a threefold way. From past sins, from our present sins, and from our future sins. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 tells us we are saved entirely. You know what he said? First Thessalonians 5 23 says body, soul, and spirit is saved. You know, some people got the idea that uh, when you die, you're just annihilated. That's the end of you. No, it's not. You can take this old body and you can put it in a casket or you can throw it in the sea or you can burn it. You can do whatever you want to with it. But God says he's going to raise it up one day. And so not only is my soul saved, but my body is saved, my spirit is saved. And First Thessalonians five twenty three says, body, soul, and spirit is saved by the voice of God. So when it talks about three stories, it's talking about threefold salvation. Then notice Genesis chapter six and verse fourteen with me. Genesis chapter six and verse fourteen: Make thee an ark to go for wood. Room shall thou make it in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without, with pitch. I made a canoe one time. I thought, boy, I'm going to make me a canoe. I'll build one of my own. I couldn't afford one, so I got me some little old sheets of plywood, and I got me some wood, and I put all this stuff together, and then I, what I call caulking it. You know, the seam, though, you put this caulking in between it. And I put it on a, I made me a thing to build it out of and everything, you know. And I had that thing just right. And then I took the uh, template and that thing went, Phew. I got my axe and cut it up and threw it away. That thing twisted on me when I got it off the template. But what I'm trying to get through to you this morning is that you have to, in between is cracks. In the, between the wood, they would make the boards and they put the board together as he made that art and in between those boards was an opening and the Bible says that he pitched it in between those boards with pitch and you go through the Bible and you look up the word pitch and it means that now listen to it, that's pitched on the inside and the outside absolutely no order can come through this is the same word in the Hebrew as atonement. And Jesus' blood is our atonement. Just as that pitch was in between those boards, keeping that world outside, keeping the wrath of God outside, keeping that water outside, it cannot come in to where Noah is safe in the ark. The blood of Jesus Christ is between me and all of hell and all that Satan can do. He cannot get to me. I'm safe in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ covers all our sins. 1 John 1, 7. The ark has one window. You know, you have noticed that window? Upward. It's upward. Christians are not to look to this world, but we are to look to Christ alone. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 14. 
Now, just like Noah, who went through death and judgment in type, we as believers have gone through death and judgment in Christ Jesus. And Noah was resurrected, the resurrected type. Noah came out of that ark to a new creation. Everything was dead. It was gone. Noah came out of that ark. He came out to a new creation. We too will come through death, the grave, the resurrected new life in Christ Jesus. Amen. One last thing, and I love this. In type and figure of salvation of Noah, I want you to go to Genesis now, chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, I want you to look at one verse, verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. You know what a token is? Let me, let me explain it this way. Did you know one of the ways I know I'm saved? I have a token of the Holy Spirit in me. God did not leave me alone. He gave me the Holy Spirit in me, and He will never leave me. And I have the witness of the Holy Spirit in my body. That's a token that I am saved. Let me give you a token that Noah had from God. Look at verse 13. Do it. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token or a witness of a covenant between me and the earth. Now, I want you to watch this because it's so important. From this time on, when Noah saw a storm coming up, he need not fear. It would soon pass over. By faith, Noah would look to the rainbow and know God keeps his word. Amen? When we Christians look by faith at the cross, we can have the assurance we're saved from the judgment of God. You know, I love the cross of Calvary. I'm very careful of what I say and what I do when it comes to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see pictures and you see necklaces you see steepled on churches and all kind of things with Christ still on the cross. No, he's not. He's off of that cross. Amen. But every time I see a cross, I used to have a big old boy played baseball with me when I was younger. And uh, I wasn't saved then. But this old boy was a Catholic. And every time he went up to bat, he would do this, you know. And I had no idea what he was doing. He said he was praying and making the sign of the cross. What got me, though, he'd hit the ball every time, you know. And so after I got saved, I found out of what he was doing. Now, folks, let me give you something. I believe the cross is very important to me. It's the most sacred thing on this earth that I can even think about because it's a token of my salvation. When I think of the cross now being empty, it was not always empty. There was a time that a man died on that cross, and he died for my sins. And that man was God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time I see that empty cross, I think of one thing. God came down to this earth and went to that cross for me. And he died and was buried and rose again in newness of life for me. And so when I see a cross, I a token of my salvation. And when Noah seen that rainbow in a cloud, and just like every day, every time a storm comes up today, I see this beautiful rainbow. My grandpa had me believing at the end of the field where he used to get me to hold corn, they would get up and they would come up a storm and a beautiful rainbow would be way down at the end of the field and it'd come down to the earth. And grandpa always told me, son, if you run down to the end of that rainbow, you'll find a pot of gold. I'd run my legs off trying to get to the end of that rainbow before it left. I never did find it. But every time I see a rainbow today in those clouds, I think of one thing. Jesus died for me. That's a token of my salvation. Now, I want you to watch this. It's a wonderful thing. When a Christian looked by faith at the cross, we can have the assurance we're safe from God's judgment. The rainbow is between heaven and earth. 
in Genesis chapter 9 and look at verse 3. Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But the flesh of the life thereof is the blood thereof shall you not eat. Now, when I think of these verses, the rainbow is between me and God. The rainbow is in six colors. That's, did you know that's the number of man in the Bible? The number six? The rainbow is in six colors. You blend it together, it makes seven. That's perfection. Three primary colors. Deity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three secondary colors. Resurrection, two divisions of colors. Second person of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ. Primary colors in the rainbow. Red, green, purple. Red, sin, suffering, and sacrifice. Green, life, and grace. Purple, royalty. Secondary colors, orange, yellow, and blue. Now listen, orange is kingship. Yellow is death. Blue is heaven. Amen. When I see that rainbow, and I talk about, talk about, and I think about Noah being saved by the grace of God, there's one thing that I think about Noah that means everything. Look back now with me, please, to chapter 6 in the last verse. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Do you know what you have to do to be saved? You have to do what God tells you to do. That's all. That's all you got to do. But after I'm saved, thank God I can know I'm saved. You know how? Because I have a token of the Holy Spirit in me. When I look at the rainbow and I look at the colors there, they represent all walks of my life. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. If I, I do you know what I'm? I'm a king. I'm joint heirs of the Lord Jesus Christ. Orange. Listen, yellow. Sure, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised again. Blue. Thank God I'm going to heaven one of these days. Amen. Everything about Noah's life is a type of mine, your salvation. And so I don't have to go out wondering if I'm saved. God put a rainbow in the sky, and he put it there for a purpose. And it reminds me every time I see a storm, every time I see a, a black cloud coming, it's going to be over in a little while. Amen. And I got news for you. All this mess that's going on in the world right now that the devil is ahead of, it's all going to be over in a little while. And we're going home. Amen. Stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, when I look at the blueness of your beautiful sky like it's out there today, Lord, we get goosebumps all over us because we've never seen beyond that. We can't imagine what's out there beyond that. But every time we see the rainbow, we realize that one of these days we're going to fly over that rainbow. We're going to go beyond this mess. We're going home to your heaven. We're looking forward to that great day. I pray if there's somebody out there today that's listening, that they'll understand that Jesus is the only way. There's only one door into the ark. There's only one door into salvation, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. There's only one window. We look up for our salvation unto God the Father. Only one God. And Father, I pray if somebody's worried about their salvation, some thing the devil has reminded them that they're not perfect, help us to understand the pitch will not let the wrath of God come in on us. We're saved by the grace of God from the wrath of God. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.